Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to Ellensburg, Washington, USA. How y'all doing tonight? The local time is 647. We will begin our program on Ice Age Lakes at the top of the hour at 6 o'clock. So as always, if you're watching this in a replay form, go ahead and skip ahead 12 minutes if you're ready to start the actual show. But if you want to join us for the next 12 minutes, the folks who are with us live are chiming in. And we're testing audio and video and that sort of thing. Hello, Kirkland. Good afternoon, Tacoma. AV is good. AV is great. Sounds good. That's always nice to hear. Good evening, Evelyn. Good. We'll get this taken care of before we start. Uh, Sunbury, Ontario. I've seen you've been with us a number of times. Uh, I'd love to say a special hello to any children watching us this evening. Uh, and uh, maybe if you're first time with us with the live stream, love to say hi to you too. Elaine, Shoreline, Jupiter, Florida, Silver Lake, Oregon. East Tennessee. Gavin, hello, age 11. Hello, Gavin. Thank you for joining us tonight. Ryan and Jack from California. Wonderful to see you. Stacy from Spain. Hello. Goodbye, muffler boy, muffler man. Take a nice long drive tonight. Why don't you go for, I don't know, an hour or so. I, uh, oh, hi, Mom. Glad you're with us tonight. R Rick, age 14, from Utah. How you doing tonight? Are you here because you have to be or you want to be? I hope it's because you're wanting to be. But I understand if you're, if you're required to watch something like this. Finland? Middle of the night, how you doing? Spain, I guess, is middle of the night too. What is it there, like one in the morning, two in the morning? Hi, Julie. Portugal, 2 a.m., okay, man. Great to have you. Uh, 3.50 a.m., how does that work? Oh, I see. Yes, you're being precise. 3.50 a.m. 3 a.m. in France. Oh, my goodness. Well, I got to do extra. Belgium, 2 in the morning, almost 3 in the morning. I never really thought about that, you guys. Truly in the middle of the night. So maybe I should try hard tonight. Uh, speaking of... For those that were with us last night, we were talking about the Palouse Hills out in the backyard. And I wanted to be in the backyard again tonight, but we're starting to prep the outside of our house for painting. So at least for the next couple days, I think we'll be in the front porch here. It was also supposed to be windy tonight, but the wind hasn't really started yet. So I'm kind of ticked off because I think we probably could have done it outside, but whatever. We're here, we're all set up in the front porch, and tomorrow night we're supposed to have strong winds, so I'm totally fine about being indoors again tomorrow night. Some of you actually, it sounds like, prefer the front porch. Others prefer the backyard, to each their own, I always say. And uh, assuming the weather is nice and the wind is down and the workers are not here painting or prepping to paint our house, we will be out in the backyard, I hope, both Saturday and Sunday, uh, morning, 9 o'clock Pacific time, talking about climate. Can't believe I'm saying that. I got some work to do between now and then, but I'm not going to think about that. 
Um, it's time for a thank you. I'd like to thank Joanna and Neil from Tri-Cities. That's down in southern Washington. That's a two-hour drive from Tri-Cities to here. And Joanna and Neil drove two hours, visited with me in the backyard. We kept our distance, sat in the red chairs out there by the frogs, visited for a while. They wanted to give me a gift that we're going to use for tonight's lecture and then two hour drive back home. So thank you, Joanna and Neil. And I will reveal tonight's gift. Uh, oh, probably 15 minutes. I don't think it'll be. No, I'm definitely not going to wait till the question and answer tonight. Hello, Daniel, age 12. Good to see you. I'm sorry if you're a child who just chimed in and I, and I missed it. I'm sorry. That wasn't very nice of me, was it? Asking to say hi to kids and then I wasn't really looking at the comments. I've got all the, all the windows open. I got the doors open. UK, hello, Peter. Minneapolis, Susan. Um, so technology-wise, I was surprised that after our show last night with the Palouse Luce and the Kitchen Flower, and we'll touch on touch on that to start with again tonight if you missed it. I was surprised that within minutes after we finished last night, I could watch the replay with the comments. I don't know, did you notice that? And uh, I didn't right away. I went and took a walk and then came back and, and I watched it late last night. But uh, hello, uh, uh, Sam, age 17. Uh, thank you for joining us three times. Um, so I don't know what happened. I don't know if I'm officially approved by YouTube now or something, uh, but I normally, uh, for the last couple of weeks, have had to wait a full 12 hours before I could watch the replay with the comments. I, I want to read your comments so that I can see what interests you, what bores you, uh, so I can catch a bunch of the comments that I didn't catch in, in real time, which is a, a regular thing here. Uh, so, um, I guess we'll see if, if that's the story again tonight. I have been kind of behind the scenes playing with the settings, but I've been doing those settings for a couple of weeks. I still haven't had luck. So anyway, it's, that's a minor point. The other thing I think I'll mention, got five minutes, is uh, I saw something that I didn't know was possible on YouTube yesterday. There's a musician named Corey Wong. And he's a guy from the Twin Cities, an excellent guitarist. He plays regularly with a band called Wolfpeck, which I enjoy. Or Wolfpeck. Anyway, Corey Wong did this concert, this live concert with an orchestra in the Netherlands. I think it was the Netherlands. Rotterdam. Is that in the Netherlands? Embarrassing, I don't know that. Anyway, uh... He set on YouTube, I subscribed to his YouTube channel, Corey Wong, W-O-N-G. So, you know, instead of like a scheduled live thing like I do for these, it was a scheduled premiere. And I'm like, okay. And so then I, I watched the premiere after the fact, the whole concert, and I really enjoyed it. It was mixed beautifully and really inspiring. But I could read the re I could watch the replay of the concert. I could see the real the live comments scrolling, and Corey was part of the comments. Like he was answering all sorts of questions and saying, "Watch what I do here." You know, this I had a problem with this solo, and and in the live comments, he's interacting and and doing kind of like a live Q and A while the concert is happening. And I thought that was I didn't know that was possible. First of all. And, of course, I'm starting to think, well, could we do something like that at some point? Just just for fun. I'm not even sure what I would show. Everything I've done has already been aired. But, anyway, I'm thinking about that a little bit. 
Okay, I got two and a half minutes. Um, we're still doing okay with our audio and visuals. Just one more check with you. And um, framing is good, lighting is good. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Jack. I got a lot of stuff laid out again tonight, but I think I'm a bit more organized than I was last time. Famous last words. Okay. Let me take a walk around the palatial estate, and I'll be back in a couple minutes. Thanks for joining us tonight. Well, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Nick Zentner. I teach geology at the college here in Ellensburg, Washington, USA, and I'm so glad that you're with us tonight. We're in the front porch of my home, and our topic tonight is something called Ice Age Lakes. And there are three Ice Age Lakes that I had planned to discuss tonight. But when I really started thinking carefully, middle of this morning, about what I wanted to do, I realized there was too much to fit into tonight. And I've been running very long lately. We had an hour lecture and then, I don't know, 20 more minutes of live Q&A after that. So I'm, I'm getting way beyond what the original plan was, which is I'd talk for 15 minutes and then I'd answer a bunch of questions. So the plan tonight is to address Glacial Lake Missoula a bit but I want to save most of Glacial Lake Missoula for its own live stream. There's so much there. I mean, to be totally honest, I sat down and watched this Glacial Lake Missoula video that I made with Tom Foster five years ago, and I'd forgotten that we packed a lot of stuff into that show. That was the last program that we made together, and it was one of our best, I think. And so I was writing all these notes down, I'm like, oh, I forgot about that, and oh yeah, there's all these interesting questions that remain about Glacial Lake Missoula, so you've heard my first point. We'll talk about Missoula a bit, but we're going to save most of Glacial Lake Missoula for next week. So what is the plan tonight then? The plan is to take a few of the concepts that we discussed last night involving Palouse. And if you want to stop this and go back and watch this one, if you're watching these in replay form, it would make probably more sense to do that before you finish with us here. But for all of you that are here, the plan is to take some of the Palouse Lust discussion, take the next step, and bring a big Ice Age flood through the area and sweep a bunch of that Lust away. 
Sweep a bunch of that kitchen flour away. Have the water pick all of that kitchen flour up. And then redeposit the flour someplace else. Where? In an Ice Age lake. So we're really talking about two major lakes tonight. Lake Lewis and Glacial Lake Columbia. He goes to the whiteboard. So the chalkboard's still in the backyard, so it's, it's whiteboard time. Trying not to have a ton of glare. I think we've got it here. We are going to the cozy fort a little bit. You know what? I do have a black sheet tonight. What if I just drape the black sheet around the shoulders of this very beautiful ladder? Nope. <laughs> All right. So, uh, pulling back, what do we have here? Let's look carefully. Well, we're during the Ice Age. We have this huge continental glacier, the Canada Ice Sheet, the grist mill for much of the wind blown loose of last night. And we have my backyard here in Ellensburg, Washington, and we have Wenatchee, we have Grand Coulee Dam, Spokane, Washington, Lewiston, Idaho, and Tri-Cities, where Joanna and Neil drove up from on Monday morning. Okay, the lakes are Glacial Lake Missoula, Glacial Lake Columbia, Lake Lewis. Now, this is not Glacial Lake Lewis, even though it is during the Ice Age time. It's a minor point. But if you're truly a glacial lake, you are a body of water that exists because there's no way for that water to leave and ice is blocking your way. In other words, there's an ice dam in northern Idaho that's making a blockage. And so Glacial Lake Missoula is result. This is the Okanagan lobe of the ice sheet. It's blocking the way, and so water in the Columbia River Valley gets backed up. That's Glacial Lake Columbia. So think of both of these glacial lakes as being bathtubs, and they get filled with water, and there's definitely a plug in the bottom of the bathtub. In other words, the drain is plugged with a big old cork. The ice is our cork. But by comparison, Lake Lewis, which we'll spend a fair amount of time with and talk about in video form as well tonight, never has a plug. The only reason Lake Lewis exists at all is because we're going to do some Ice Age flooding, which most of you are familiar with, and there is a narrow gap. There's basically a hole in a ridge called the Horse Heaven Hills, and that gap is quite narrow, Wallula Gap. And so there's way too much water to fit through this gap all at once. And so this is a bathtub, Lake Lewis, but it's not a glacial lake because we don't have a glacier holding the water back. And the other major difference, which is important, is that we never have a plug in Wallula Gap. Wallula Gap is never plugged with a landslide or never plugged with ice. It's an open drain. So the duration of our bathtub water in Lake Lewis is going to be far shorter than the duration of the water sitting in these bathtubs up to the north. I'll give you a number based on some evidence I'll show you later on. We think each time we have a Lake Lewis, that water is sitting there for a few weeks. But we're confident that the water in Glacial Lake Missoula or Glacial Lake Columbia sits there for decades before it drains catastrophically. Okay, so that's a map of the three lakes, but really it's like two and a half lakes. Right? As I've already discussed, we're not going to go deeply into Glacial Lake Missoula this week. But it's just water, and the water's gone. I mean, if you're an Ice Age lake, you're a lake during the Ice Age, and it's not the Ice Age anymore, meaning that there isn't a bunch of ice uh, sitting in uh, northern Washington today. So what can we go visit today, like tomorrow morning, get in the car and start driving, how will we know if we're in the bottom of one of these Ice Age lakes? Here's the thing to look for. So we'll be looking at a lot of this tonight. Aren't these amazing? There are places where we have these kind of chalky tan layers 
and they have these amazing patterns and layers within them. Like this is another layered system. And these beds are confused sometimes because there's different names associated with them. All three of these headings are pretty much synonymous. They mean the same thing. I'm fond of slack water sediments. That's what we call these things. In other words, this is stuff that we're forming somehow at the bottom of these temporary ice age lakes. So can I do it? Slack water sediments, AKA rhythmites, AKA Tushi beds are found at the bottom of each of these glacial lakes, including Lake Lewis. In fact, this photo is taken at the floor of Lake Lewis across the Columbia River from Hanford, a place called the White Bluffs. So we're gonna study these slack water sediments a fair amount. You can see why they're called rhythmites. They have a rhythmic bedding. There's something regularly going on and it's not steady. There's this kind of this alternating thing. We'll get into it. Sometimes they're called the Tushi beds. At least they are in Washington because there's a little town called Tushi and near Tushi, near Walla Walla, is a very famous place where a bunch of these beds are on display. We'll look at some short video clips from that Burlingame Ravine. But it's slack water sediment time that's really going to be our main focus. You with me so far? Now let me ask you a question. What kind of stuff is in these beds? We know we're at the bottom of an ice age lake. It's almost like we got the lake water right there. It's blue, right? But actually, was the water blue? And the next question is, what do you think is in these layers? If we get up there, do we need a, a rock hammer to really go crazy on these things? Or like, are they solid rock layers? Is it like, I don't know, what does it look like to you? Is it sandstone or is it shale or something like that? Or is it possible these are actually layers of dirt or soil? or kitchen flour? That's actually the answer. What we're looking at is the kitchen flour of last night, but there's an important distinction. Now our kitchen flour has layers to it. And when we had that kitchen flour, that loose in the Palouse Hills, we knew that that silt was blown in by the wind and it didn't have layering. So somehow we've got to figure out how we're going to get from unstratified, non-layered kitchen flour in the Los Hills of last night, move it, and somehow now have it look like this, where we have many beds of this essentially redeposited Los in the bottom of a lake. I hope you're feeling comfortable that's really the framework of our discussion tonight. And then we'll get some real tiny details out of some of those slack water sediments to give us a feel for timing of when some of these ice age floods were happening. He goes to the other whiteboard. So last night we discussed that we have a bunch of basalt bedrock underneath a bunch of wind blown loose making up the Palouse Hills. I use the analogies kitchen flour. We actually had kitchen flour last night and the German chocolate cake. We didn't have a German chocolate cake last night, but long ago in our live stream series, I did have a German chocolate cake and I was drilling through it. So here, if you're brand new to us tonight, is the expanse of the German chocolate cake. Wow. Can't get the glare to go down. You can do your best. I practiced with the cozy fort, by the way, and we're not gonna have glare tonight. You have my word. But until we get into the cozy fort, we're gonna have glare, I'm afraid. So this is the area of the Pacific Northwest that has been flooded by basalt. And this is what I'm calling the German chocolate cake because we have layer upon layer of basalt. And that basalt is heavily fractured. And that basalt, 16 million year old basalt, underlies this whole area where we did the Ice Age flood studying. Now you don't see German chocolate cake here because we're not in the German chocolate cake. We're in these softer 
loess layers, which we're calling slack water sediment layers, sitting on top of the German chocolate cake. So I guess we need another, I don't know, what do we need? We need another name for this? This isn't the German chocolate cake, but it's layered. Well, I'm a little ahead of myself. And now we're going to do this. So many of you know about the Missoula floods, and you know that there are times when we release a bunch of water, and we have that high energy water, this Missoula flood water, racing across eastern Washington at freeway speeds. And that water is heading right for our kitchen flour sitting on top of German chocolate cake, and it's not even close. This is going to get absolutely hammered by this water. And you're like, well, what does that mean? Well, the first thing to go, the first thing that can easily be lifted up and carried away is the kitchen flour. I mean, what was the thickness of our loess last night? We had an average of 50 feet, but there were places that the Palouse Hills Luss was more than 250 feet in thickness, covering a wide area. And I read your comments last night. A few of you, actually more than a few, were saying, oh, I don't believe it's just Luss coming from glaciers that were grinding up the rock. That's way too much Luss for that. And you have a fair point. Are we missing the total origin of that Luss? That's not our tonight's topic, but we have an incredible amount of this wind-blown loess, and it was definitely brought in on the wind. My point is, if we have one of these major floods, we're going to easily take the loess away, and that's our focus tonight. Tomorrow night, if you come back and join us, we're going to dig deeper with the Ice Age flood water, and we're going to lift out a bunch of bedrock and make a bunch of waterfalls, but that's not tonight. So, we took a bunch of loess away. Here it is traveling within the Missoula flood water. So was the Missoula flood water that has just picked up, think of all that soil. And by soil, I don't just mean a little thin skiff of soil, right? I mean 200 feet of kitchen flowers being picked up easily by this flood water. Is that water going to be crystal clear? Is that water going to be blue? I don't think it is. It's here's the silt being carried in suspension within this Missoula flood. And you're like, I can't picture where you're talking about now. Well, when we have an ice dam failure in Northern Idaho, and we drain Glacial Lake Missoula, that's called a Missoula flood, and we pick up a bunch of loess during the journey through northern Idaho from Glacial Lake Missoula to Glacial Lake Columbia, and we're going to dump a bunch of loess into this lake. As we've discussed in past live streams, we're also going to, depending on the size of the flood, there were multiple floods, depending on the size of the flood, we're going to displace a bunch of water that was already sitting there in Glacial Lake Columbia, and we're going to have water spill out of the south rim of the bathtub and head for Lake Lewis. And when we do that spillage, that's also where we're picking up a bunch of this loess. In fact, primarily, our discussion last night was talking about the loess here and how we're going to take a bunch of that loess away. Let me show you a couple of quick maps, and then I think we need to go to the Cozy Fort right away and look at a couple of video clips from the air. I wish you were all in the room with me right now. I could really sense if we were all together or not. I think we are. How do I know? By the way, here's a prop. Here's one of my favorite ways to discuss this episode of Nick from Home brought to you by Gold Chocolate Low Fat Milk 1%. You gotta love it. Oh. Ooh, it's chocolatey. So here's a glass of Ice Age flood water. After it has carried through, after the water has busted through some of these rolling hills of Luss, 
I think it looks like chocolate milk, and that's the common analogy that I use. Bottoms up. But I think there's a problem. I think that analogy works just fine, and people kind of chuckle. Oh, yeah, chocolate milk. I know what that is. I used to have it for you know, milk break in, in elementary school. But based on all the props we've been using with food, maybe chocolate milk is not the best analogy. Because I've already used chocolate, haven't I, with the basalt, with the, with the bedrock down below? I've used the German chocolate cake, and I don't mean to imply that the Missoula floodwater carrying all the silt, which is what I just said was like chocolate milk, and I do believe it was brown or at least tan, it's maybe confusing if we just, if I just say chocolate milk and then people go, oh, chocolate cake, so what, there's like basalt chocolate cake that's in the water? No, it's, it's, this, it's this kitchen flour that last night we realized was actually tan, kind of a tan color instead of truly white kitchen flour. I don't know, there must be some, I should actually should find some flour that's actually brown. I'm sure there's some organic kind of groovy uh, flour that looks brown instead of white. I'm showing my ignorance now with my baking. But last night I did, before our live stream, go up on our hill and I did find a bunch of loose and the, you wouldn't call that white, would you? It's silt. It's got the consistency that we need. It's truly loose. It was blown in on the wind and deposited here in central Kittitas Valley. So I promised some tricks up my sleeve. So I had a moment of inspiration. Instead of chocolate milk, I want to actually do a quick little experiment. So this is what's known as a spoon, kids. This is a spoon. And this is a jar full of actual loose that doesn't really look like Nestle Quick. It's got a different color to it, more of a tan. I mean, come on now, we're eventually going to do this. But we got to get this loose into some water. So I went to the Super One grocery store today. Super One grocery store in Ellensburg, Washington. You got to love it. And I bought some Gatorade, which I never do. And I took the label off. I don't know why. Oh, I know why, so that you can see what's going on inside. And I haven't chugged that yet, but that's in a different container in their fridge. Uh, can I do this with you watching me? I think you can. Somebody's going to get the porch dirty. Well, I've never done this. I need a smaller spoon. Hang on. This is a smaller spoon, kids. This is what's known as a spoon, and it's smaller. Luss. Oh, yeah. Luss. Where's my laptop? Is this getting all over my laptop? I hope not. Luss. Three spoonsfuls of Luss. So my idea is, and I didn't test it out, so we'll see if it works. I don't know, maybe this still looks like chocolate milk to you, but it's truly loose being carried in the water. And, and the water is, is moving fast. The water, this is water that's in high energy water, this is loose that's in high energy water that's been picked up as the flood path goes right through a bunch of Palouse Hills. And this is the color of the water that's now going to end up down here. And a common question is, if these are such powerful floods, why didn't it just bust through that whole ridge? What's so strong about Wallula Gap to remain it being a very narrow gap? And the answer basically is, this whole area between the fast water and Wallula Gap is a broad open area called the P P uh, Pasco Basin. And so our water is going to naturally be slowing down as it spreads out. So, are you with me? I'm wondering if this will happen in a minute's time. 
when we finally slow this water and then stop this water, we've lost the energy in the water. And if we're patient, with each passing day of Lake Lewis, the water is going to get more and more clear. I don't know, does it need, does it need to breathe? Stupid question. So you can maybe already see, well, let me try that again. If I shake and shake, <coughs> oh God, right on. I want it to be the same kind of chocolate or same kind of dark tan color. And then let's notice if stuff falls out right away. Maybe not gonna work. What I'm trying to demonstrate here, and I guess I'll set this on the table behind me and give it another 10 minutes, but I, I, at least you can get a sense of what I'm trying to do. With each passing day of Lake Lewis sitting there, standing water, it's truly a lake, we're gonna have more and more of this silt, which used to be in the Palouse Hills, fall to the bottom of Lake Lewis. And with each passing day, the water, the lake water itself is gonna get more and more clear. Make sense to you? It's like a snowstorm of silt, of tan silt at the bottom of the lake. And what I'm demonstrating for you is, what happens if we bring that lake water with all that suspended silt and stop the water and take that fast moving Missoula flood, stop the water and wait a few days. The wait a few days is getting all this silt to fall, gravity, fall to the bottom of the lake. And by the time that the water of Lake Lewis finally threads its way through, like this is water waiting its turn to get through this little narrow turnstile. You know, it's like going to a, a rock show, music show, and everybody's, you know, in this mob outside of the stadium and everybody has to wait their turn to go through security. Eventually, we're all gonna get through security. I'm saying that by the time we get the last of the Lake Lewis water through Alula Gap, that water's gonna be pretty clear. And why is that important? Well, we are going to have a record of Lake Lewis, aren't we? It's going to be one of these tan layers. And I'll cut right to the chase. We have multiple slack water sediment layers, which everyone now in geologist, geology agrees, each of these slack water sediment layers is a separate Lake Lewis. Which means every one of these slack water sediment layers is a different Ice Age flood. So it's worth studying these slack water sediment layers if they can tell us not only how many floods there were, but the timing of these. Maybe we can actually get some dates from these slack water sediment layers. I don't know, how are we doing? Yeah. I can see there's plenty of this luss. It's literally the luss now we're talking about that's in the bottom of this Gatorade jug, but I think you get my point. We do have an evidence. We do have a deposit. We have a deposit from an Ice Age flood, and it's from stopping the flood water cold, like putting the brakes on, and having all that suspended sediment fall to the bottom. And that sediment is still there for us to enjoy. Muffler boy. Okay, that was my attempt to explain how slack water sediment layers form. They're forming in water, but the sediment itself was originally in Palouse Hills. So we're done with my little storyboard. We picked up the lus, we carried it in the flood water, we stopped the flood water, all the silt fell to the bottom, we drained Lake Lewis through Wallula Gap, and all the silt that was in that lake is now one slack water sediment. 
layer, one rhythmite, one tushi bed. And then if we do the whole process again, and the flood comes through and picks up more of our silt, carries it, drops it, get rid of the water, another slack water sediment layer, another slack water sediment layer. What are we doing? We're building another cake, aren't we? It's like we had a German chocolate cake down here, which was the basalt, and now these slack water sediment layers, stacked one on top of another, made out of silt, soft silt. You don't have to use a hammer. You can just paw into it with your hand. We need another cake. Don't we? All right. Joanna and Neil from Tri-Cities, Washington, drove a cake up to me. The cake was transported by vehicle up through the Yakima River Canyon and was delivered to my backyard. Joanna owns Foodies Brick and Mortar restaurants. There's two of them, one in Kennewick, Washington, one in Richland, Washington. And she wanted me to have a special cake for this lecture. So thank you, Joanna and Neil, for the delivery, for the generosity. The cake's been in our fridge since Monday night. Liz is like, when do we get to eat some of the cake? I'm like, we gotta wait till after Wednesday's show. It's Wednesday, right? Let me show you this cake. Here's the cake box. I wonder what kind of cake it is. I wonder if it's going to have layering. I wonder if it's going to be a nice analog for our slack water sediments. What cake should it be? Thank you, Joanna and Neil, for the gift. It's an amazing cake. And I didn't want to cut it open until we were all here together. It's heavy. I said, Liz, would you mind weighing this cake? She's like, how am I going to do that? I'm like, can you stand on the cake? How much do you weigh? Burp, burp, burp. Then hold the cake. Burp, burp, burp. It's a 15 pound cake. It's a 15 pound cake. I can't cut it open one handed. So you can see the cake from where you are. I think you can. Uh, Oh my God, that's good. Oh my God, that's good. This is a carrot cake. And from this point on, I christen carrot cakes as the analog or the analogy for our slack water sediments. Let me give you a better look. Okay, we got one, two, three, four layers that I can see. And we have three frosting layers in between. We're gonna be able to use that 
because we need to figure out how old our slack water sediment layers are. And we can't really go into the actual layers of the cake to get an age. We need to look at the boundaries between the slack water sediment layers. This is a huge cake. I don't need to eat this whole cake in the next week. And I think I will if it stays in this house. So if you're in Ellensburg or you want to paint make a little trip to Ellensburg tomorrow night after our live stream I'll be in the backyard and especially Evelyn or other families that want to come over I'll have a bunch of this cake in uh, Ziploc bags and we'll, we'll keep our distance uh, but I'll be out by the frogs and we'll uh, give you a piece of this cake okay So let's keep it moving. Our loose originally looked like this, wind-blown silt on top of the basalt, kitchen flour on top of the German chocolate cake. Depending on where the flood water traveled, it went right through hills with hundreds of feet of that kitchen flour. And so it's no surprise then that we're going to redeposit that kitchen flour in the bottom of Lake Lewis and make a carrot cake. Here's another look at the same thing. This is the whole area affected by the Ice Age floods. You can see Spokane up north. And I want you to notice how many of these places in the channeled scab lands were completely untouched by these Ice Age floodwaters. And therefore we have this amazing thing where we have these islands of kitchen flour that were completely missed. But where the floodwaters were traveling, of course the list got carried away easily and redeposited down here. Before we go to a few video clips, let me give you a better sense of what that looks like out in the field. Here's an amazing map from Bruce Bjornstad. It was in his first Ice Age floods book. If you're familiar with Southern Washington or Central Washington, this is a very carefully reconstructed map of the biggest that Lake Lewis was able to get. The magic number, 1,250 feet elevation. Do you live on this map? Do you know the elevation of your backyard? Is it below or above 1,250 feet elevation above sea level? If it's below, if your house is below 1,250 elevation, you were underneath this Ice Age lake. And we're going to wait till next week for the evidence for that because I've also decided we're going to do a full live stream on erratics, boulders. We need to study erratics to figure out that high water mark. But the point is on the floor of this Lake Lewis, and remember there were multiple Lake Lewises, we're making the carrot cake. We're making the carrot cake, the slack water layers, one after another. I'm going to look for one other map, and if I can't find it, oh well. I'm, I'm repeating myself too much now, but I want to look at the Luss Islands one more time from the air. And now this is from a field trip handout I did not long ago. Here's an amazing look at the Palouse from the air and how amazing and how thick and how continuous whole sections of southeastern Washington are with kitchen flour that was not touched a lick by the Ice Age floods. This is really what I want to show you. This is one of my favorite places in Washington. 
And the landmark here is Ritzville, which is along Interstate 90. If you're willing and you're brave and you've got a full tank of gas and you've got a nice smile and you want to go out into this country, this is going out into a very remote area, an amazingly remote area for the state of Washington. And there's gravel roads and there's hardly any farmsteads. And there are these incredible islands of Luss. Now remember, this was one continuous blanket of Luss before the floods. But look at how much Luss is gone. There's the underlying German chocolate cake. And this was covered in the National Geographic magazine a few years ago. And here's one of those Luss islands. But we know that it wasn't just an island. It was a, it's a remnant of a once continuous, continuous cover of that kitchen flower. So it's a drive a few of these back roads over by Eskier Ranch and a few other little towns like Binge. You can, you can see, even from the ground, the impact of what we're talking about. So that's my cue to show you two short clips in the cozy fort. We'll come back out, get some fresh air. I can cool off. I can look at some data for you to come up with timing of the floods. We'll go back in the cozy fort, a couple more short videos, and then your questions and answers. Okay, so cozy fort by Steve, trademark. Got to stick the ton out like Charlie Brown. Uh huh. Oh, what's that? Oh, what are we doing now? Oh, seriously, bro? Okay. Yep. This part where I talk to myself, I mute the live stream. I queue up. There's a guy named Tom Tabbert. And Tom is in Spokane. And I met Tom after one of one of the geology talks I gave down the Tri-Cities long ago. And he's in the medical community in, Tri in Spokane, but he said, I like flying my trike, my ultralight. And I've got HD cameras on the wings. And if you want me to film anything, uh, I'd be happy just to go up and do that for you and give you the footage. So this is six or seven years ago, Tom flying. I've got the sound off. So he's flying in his ultralight. He's got his camera, cameras on his wings, above his head, out on his nose, essentially. But I'm gonna let this run because do you see what he's flying over right now? Right below him is a place where the loose is mostly gone, swept away by the Ice Age floods. But look at how abruptly to his left at about 11 o'clock. Do you see that? Look at how crazy that change is between where the Luss is gone and where the Luss Hills are. So the opposite way of saying that is, think of this as being all through this whole area. And therefore, think about all the Luss got, that got picked up and much of it redeposited in the floor of Lake Lewis. Of course, much more of it went all the way down to the Willamette Valley in Oregon, and even more of the Lewis, I suppose, got all the way out to the Pacific. But Tom's got his amazing stuff here to show us that transition. I'm gonna move it ahead a little bit because I think there's one other section I wanna show you. Yeah. On his, look at that. So here he's got Luss Hills below him, completely untouched. You can see that matured topography before the Ice Age floods. So there's obviously a bunch of Ice Age flood water that cruised through on his far right. But then here's another, and amazingly, look at how arrow straight that channel is right below him right now. That's another pathway of some of the Ice Age flood water. So I hope you know, you know the old saying, pictures are worth a thousand words. This is moving pictures. And I thank Tom Tabbert for this. Tom Tabbert, he's, 
He calls himself T-Tabs, and he has a YouTube channel with a bunch of flying stuff, and he narrates them as well. T-Tabs YouTube channel. T-T-A-B-B-S, I think. T-Tabs. Now, I'm not going to screw with the Bose thing, I don't think, for this one. I want to show you that little clip that I showed you last night, but we'll run it a little bit more because Tom Foster and I were on the ground in the place that you were just watching from the air. And we'll give you a sense of what it's like from the ground. From the ground. People, Luce Hill is just south of Hooper, Washington. This is the Palouse, a series of rolling wheat fields, winter wheat. And the hills are made out of Luss silt, kitchen flour, wind-blown silt. Before the Ice Age, this is what Eastern Washington looked like. All of Eastern Washington, stretching from the Cascades clear over to the Rocky Mountains. Nothing but this, 250 feet of Luss on top of Columbia River basalt bedrock. But we've got big areas of Eastern Washington that don't have these hills anymore. What happened? So here's one of many places that's exciting because the Luce Hills are gone. Luce Hill, graceful contour, boom, gone. We drop right down to the basalt floor and there's some remnants of Luce Hills there in the distance. The Ice Age floods came through here, took the Luss away. The high energy water picking the Luss Hills up easily. The water was probably brown with all this silt. And then the soil here was redeposited further downstream where the water slowed down. Most famously in the Willamette Valley of Western Oregon. Good agricultural down there because they got our soil. It used to be up here. And in the flood paths, we've got remnants of the Luce Hills that have been streamlined. Flood waters over the top and around the sides of those hills with these long, graceful tails downstream. Those streamlined hills are aligned with the path of the flood water like salmon holding their position with their heads upstream as the water's coursing over them. Luce Hills, just south of Hooper, Washington. All right. Okay, I want to make sure we're still live streaming, number one. Looks like we are. I want to do a, a bit, hello, I want to do a bit more with you. Damn, it's hot under that with you. Oh. Glasses all got fogged up. There's details in the Slackwater sediment from Glacial Lake Columbia and Lake Lewis that I want to talk with you about, and then we'll go right back to the Cozy Fort to finish this out, okay? Let's go lake by lake. Lake Lewis is where we'll go with some video in just a second. And we're going to the, the carrot cake. And I've been showing you the photo, mostly of what the carrot cake looks like. You remember what the photo looked like. And I wanna highlight just a couple of things. First of all, when we go to Burlingame Ravine, or if we go to the White Bluffs, or if we go to Zilla, or we go to Benton City, those are places in the lower Yakima Valley, and there are 40 beds identified, 40 layers in the carrot cake. And every one of those layers is made out of silt. There's no organic material. There's nothing to date. Geologists have been looking, trying to find anything that they can get an absolute age date on. They cannot find anything. Now, it looks like I drew this very carelessly, but I didn't. These layers, it's not an accident, get a little bit thinner as you go towards the top of the stack. You can do what you want with that, but that's an observation. It's true also for the carrot cake 
in Gl Glacial Lake Columbia and the carrot cake at the bottom of Glacial Lake Missoula. The layers are fat down below and as you go higher in the carrot cake, the layers get thinner and thinner. I didn't request that for the carrot cake. We have found one layer of volcanic ash, which is absolutely snow white. Everything else is tan. The carrot cake is tan. Oh. So there's one layer of frosting that truly stands out like a white layer in our carrot cake. And since it's volcanic ash, we can get an age for it. We can figure out which mountain erupted. And you just saw my cheat sheet. It's an ash from Mount St. Helens volcano that erupted 16,300 calendar years ago. For sure. It's called the Mount St. Helens Set S Ash, if you're a fan of geology. And the point is, we have 11 of these layers in the carrot cake in Lake Lewis that are above the ash, which means we had 11 floods younger than 16,300. And we had 29 layers below or older than 16,300. This is the only precious date we have in the entire Lake Lewis carrot cake. We'd love to get more dates. We don't have them at the moment from the slack water sediment, from the carrot cake itself. So we were just here looking at that carrot cake. You know what we're doing. Carrot cakes are slack water sediments. Slack water sediments are from the silt being dropping out of the chocolate milk Gatorade bottle. Okay, let's go up here quickly. Do we have any dates from the slack water sediments or the carrot cake at the bottom of Glacial Lake Columbia? Yes, we do. So now we're up in the sand poil arm where Lake Roosevelt is today. Brian Atwater and Michelle Hansen did this work. Brian was there in the early 1980s. Michelle is from Canada, I think Saskatchewan. She did her work uh, 10 years ago. So they have found 89 layers. Now hold on, are these 89 and these 40 somehow the same? Like, are these 40 the lower half of this carrot cake or vice versa? It'd be nice if we could do that, but correlating bed to bed between these carrot cakes is very difficult. Here's why. There's no volcanic ash in that entire sequence. So the Mount St. Helens ash of 16,300 just didn't make it up there, apparently. But, there, but Atwater found a stick, a twig, a piece of wood that he could get a radiocarbon date off of. And the radiocarbon date has been converted to a calendar year date of 17,700. Oh, the wind's kicking up now. So that's an older date. You're like, well, wait a minute, where we were before. So here's our date from Lake Lewis, 16,300. There's one date in Glacial Lake Columbia that's quite a bit older. And Michelle found some plant fragments that she also got some radiocarbon dates on recently in the last decade, 16,000, quite a bit higher in the cake. Again, we are challenged by trying to put these things together. There's another piece of information that's quite fascinating from these slack water sediments in Glacial Lake Columbia. The layers in the, in the carrot cake have some tiny details that are quite fascinating. If you're a fan of geology, you've heard the word varv and you've heard the word rhythmite. And it's quite common, even for geologists leading field trips, to use these two words interchangeably. To me and to many, they're not the same thing. So in the case of Glacial Lake Columbia, we actually have from a distance, uh, dark, light, dark, light, dark, light bands. Just imagine standing 100 yards away from a cliff face that's got some of these carrot cake layers 
in the bottom of glacial Lake Columbia. And those are the rhythmites. Those are the slack water sediments. And it turns out that the dark band, think like a zebra almost. So a zebra striping on the face of the carrot cake from a distance away, like, like from your distance to that carrot cake, you can see dark and light and dark and light. Those are the rhythmites. And in, in the, it turns out with these slack water sediments, the dark layers are usually made of clay particles, teeny tiny particles, and the light layers, yes, and the light layers are silts, okay? Now, so what's a varve then? A varve is a much tinier repetition. Notice within one dark rhythmite, there's alternating dark and light. And can you read my writing? This is SWSWSW. Do you know what that stands for? Summer, winter, summer, winter, summer, winter. These varves, so you get a dark mud and then a light mud, a dark mud and then a light mud. It basically, the clays are giving us an annual or a seasonal pattern. Now, why would that be helpful to us? Well, even if we don't really know where we are in the grand scheme of things, is this 15,000 years ago? Is this 23,000 years ago? You know, brr, brr, brr. Even though we don't know that with this sequence, what do we know? If you believe these are varves, and that water certainly did, you can count years between Ice Age floods. You can actually count up the years that a glacial lake Missoula is filling like a swimming pool. And then here comes a flood and dump a bunch of silt into glacial lake Columbia's bottom and then go back to making varves again so that you can keep track of years. So if you're good with the computer and you can find Brian Atwater, Sand Poil, Glacial Lake Columbia, those would be the keywords to punch in. I'll bet you you can find his PDF, his, his amazing USGS report in classic Brian Atwater fashion. This is the same guy that went on to do all the great earthquake stuff, but this is his first work for the USGS, working with the history of Glacial Lake Columbia. So that's the level of precision you can get at Glacial Lake Columbia, but you cannot get at Lake Lewis, mainly because the lake water in Lake Lewis wasn't around for very long. Remember, it drained after just a couple of weeks. Okay, I thought this was gonna be shorter, but you know how this goes by now. So we're almost an hour into this talk, but I can't stop. I have to show you. I had two things to show you, but I'm not gonna show you. No, I'm not gonna show you that one. All right, we're gonna finish. in the Cozy Fort with a five-minute program that was on PBS. And it does a nice job of visiting Lake Lewis. And even we get a chance to visit the Mount St. Helens Ash in the bottom of Lake Lewis. I'm sweating already. Now I'm really going to sweat. But you're what? Oh! That left a mark. sounded worse than it was. I'm coherent, I believe. Nick on the rocks. The Ice Age Mystery of Lake Lewis. What a title. Uncover buried treasure and see what makes mountains blown. Find out what shapes the top of the earth and explore the secret world below with me, Nick, on the rocks. Right, screw the Bose thing. This main street of Zilla, Washington, probably known best for its agriculture. There's orchards and vineyards surrounding the town, but geologists know Zilla because the little town sits directly on top of evidence from giant floods that happened 16,000 years ago.
But instead of loud, angry, destructive flood water like at Dry Falls, the lake beds here at Zilla were created when each fast-moving Missoula flood was stopped cold, temporarily, by Wallula Gap. That's a nice Tri shot, isn't it? Why? The water couldn't all get through the gap at once, so there was a backup. When the Missoula floodwater finally drained to the Pacific, what was left? One Ice Age lake bed, a record of an Ice Age flood. Yeah. But look, along the Yakima River at Zilla, there are over 30 lake beds stacked one on top of another. And here at Granger, along the Yakima River. And here at White Bluffs along the Columbia River. Carrot cake. Count up the lake beds and you count up the number of Missoula floods all the way from Montana. At Burlingame Canyon near Walla Walla, there are 40 beds. Amazing. When did this happen? We only have one date so far. And the date doesn't come directly from the lake beds. This is volcanic ash, white, with a bunch of gray layers above and below. Carrot cake. What's going on? Looks just like the ash of Mount St. Helens in 1980. It is Mount St. Helens. It's not 1980. This is much, much older. This has been dated at 16,300 years ago. That's the level of precision that we can get from this ash. And this ash is important to us because this is the only place we've got in the Lake Lewis Basin to know exactly where we are time-wise. And the sharp definition is important, telling us this was a momentary eruption of ash in a place where we did not have lake water, but we certainly had a lake before and after multiple times. Bruce Bjornstad, a geologist and author based in Tri-Cities, has devoted 40 years to studying the Ice Age floods in eastern Washington. In addition to the lake beds, he has worked with stranded boulders in the desert that snap the detail. Okay, we're going to cut it there because the rest is Bruce Bjornstad and the Ice Age flood erratics that we're going to save till next week. So that's my best attempt to introduce you to the slack water sediments and the secrets that they hold. And we need more people to study these carrot cakes because I'm sure we're missing a whole bunch of stuff. It'd be nice to have more dates, more precision, and maybe even possibly different origins of the silt than just coming from the Palouse. But that's an area we don't need to go to tonight. Sixty minutes. So I'm ready for your questions, finally. I'm so glad that you're still with us. And I'm gonna open up my live chat, pop it out like a pro, like a boss, and get off the top chat and go to the live chat and start scrolling like a madman. Backwards. Why did Wallula Gap not widen with all that water? Gene, it's a very common question, and part of it is how I present Wallula Gap. I present Wallula Gap as this bottleneck that doesn't get affected at all by the floods. It turns out it was widened. So if you go on top of both sides of Wallula Gap, and by the way, Neil of Neil and Joanna fame, uh, is a hero to us because he drove us in a truck all the way up to the top of Wallula Gap with all the camera equipment that we had to get that show with Bruce that I didn't even show you, but I'll show it to you next week. Um, 
when you get up there, you can see evidence for erosion, not only over some of the flood water going over the top of the both sides of Wallula Gap, uh, but also widening Wallula Gap. But again, the energy of the water had decreased a fair amount by the time it got all the way south to Wallula Gap. And so you don't have the Grand Coulee-like carving because you're so far south that that energy had already spread out into the Pasco Basin. Thank you for the question. What is the average thickness of layer of rhythmite? Well, you could kind of see some of us walking around out there, Robert. Um, you know, the thicker stuff. I'll give you a ballpark. So these guys are maybe uh, two feet. And then up one feet, maybe. Maybe some of these are three or four feet, and then on down. Something like that. It's a substantial amount. Remember, we're just looking at the edge of the carrot cake, and the carrot cake, these stock water sediments go quite a ways laterally as well. Did Lake Lewis and Lake Ringgold occupy the same area? Pasco Basin? Question mark. Great question, great point, Jack. I've led field trips down to that area talking about Lake Lewis, which was our topic tonight. And then I've had other field trips where we go down, different day, different, different topic, and we're talking about Lake Ringgold, which is between eight and three. And people kept mixing them up. So yes, I have, for tonight's discussion, We decided for tonight's discussion, Jack, we decided that we were going to have our carrot cake sitting directly on top of our German chocolate cake. In other words, our Ice Age flood deposits directly on top of the German chocolate cake, which means we're jumping from 16 million years ago to less than 2 million years ago. But I'll take your point. Much of the White Bluffs is the Ringgold Formation, which is squeezed in here between eight and three. So there are some places where you have German chocolate cake, whatever cake Ringgold is. We haven't come up with a food for that, I don't think. And then our carrot cake on top of it. We're losing track of all of our food things here. And of course, a very different story with the cutting of Hell's Canyon with studying Lake Ringgold. Where are the easiest place to say, see Lake Lewis slackwater sediments? I would Google um, White Bluffs National Monument, or I would, better yet, I've plugged these books almost every night. That was Bruce that you just met before I, I hit stop, because he was talking about erotics we don't need tonight. But this book by Bruce Bjornstad on the Trail of the Ice Age Floods, book one, has specific hiking directions on how to get your hands right on some of those slack water sediments of Lake Lewis. And the hike is less than an hour. And you park at a boat ramp uh, uh, across the river from Hanford. It's a nice area just in general. And there's erratics to look at out there as well. But that's why I love these Bjornstad books so much. It's not just general content, it's very specific places where you should drive, where you should hike, where you should fly if you have the means to fly. They're amazing, and I've used them over and over and over again. Was the Lus both deposited and carried away during the same ice age? Thank you, Mary. Well, there was no Lus at all prior to three million years ago. And we talk about the Ice Age as being the last 2.6 million years of time. But many of you know that there were many, there were dozens of cold and warm times within the Ice Age. And so that's another confusing thing that I'll try to sort out on Saturday when we talk about Ice Age climate. But to your point, I think a bunch of the lust that's in the hills is from earlier ice times, 
not really earlier ice ages, but earlier ice times within the ice age that's in the last three million years, and then a lot of bringing the Luss out of there with water is later in the uh, ice age. I know that sounds fuzzy, but we don't have the specifics of the dates, but it's, it's just from relative age dating, we know that a bunch of that Luss was there before a bunch of it got hauled off, especially from Tom Tabbert's ultralight uh, footage. Can you leave the flood channels to find dating evidence like you do with river canyons? Interesting thought, ergo, too. Um, we kind of are leaving the flood channels. We're getting to a quiet place where Lake Lewis is, and that's where we're depositing the things that we're studying. So I would think of... I've never thought of it that way, but I really like it. I would think of these areas where the flood water is moving fast as the river channels in this, in this discussion. And I would think of being downstream of the river channels where we actually drop the stuff that was picked up. So this is a, an Ice Age version of Hell's Canyon, getting a bunch of stuff, flushing it downstream, and then depositing it. Let's keep it going. Evelyn, age seven. You gonna come over tomorrow night, Evelyn, for some cake? Since they were so powerful, why didn't each new flood mix up the layer of sediment from the flood before it? Why are they such perfect layers? Evelyn, if you're coming up with all these questions just by yourself, I just can't tell you how impressed I am with you. Or maybe I should just say, Evelyn, I'm impressed with you. I'm not impressed with me finding that photo I was using earlier this session, but you can picture it. The key, Evelyn, is that the water is so quiet by the time we form Lake Lewis that there's no erosive power. So the water, Evelyn, is moving so fast through these chutes. Think of this like a, a slide in the playground. Do they still have slides on your school playgrounds? Maybe not for other reasons, but you're moving fast coming down the slide. So this is where you're doing all the erosion. But when we get to Lake Lewis, the water is quiet each time and it doesn't disturb the sediments that were there before. Great thinking by you. I hope I have you in class in 15 years. Dad would have loved this. He worked on the horse-drawn combines in the Palouse back in the 1920s. Thanks for this. Thank you, Larry, for that. Many of us have very fond and very um, specific, tangible memories, especially if we work the land with family members. Why didn't the volcanic ash in the Luss blow away if the Luss was blown it? Alan, um, I think a lot of these questions are, are mixing up. It, it's a good question, but many of these questions are kind of working on a theme, and I, I guess I didn't do a good enough job explaining the fundamental difference between where Lake Lewis water is and where the carrot cake is and where we're taking the Luss away. This is the best one I've got for you. So we're solely looking at carrot cakes where the water is standing still and the water is never coming through the Lake Lewis area at fast speeds. So we can preserve every layer in the carrot cake we can preserve that very fine layer of volcanic ash and it's not gonna be destroyed 
because nothing energetic comes in after the fact and rips it out, at least in the place that we find it. Now, it may be been ripped out nearby by a modern river or something like that, but the high energy flood water is up here, a different place than where we do this. So I, I should hit this hard again tomorrow night because we're gonna be going to a place where we're doing carving in the bedrock and we're definitely not carving in the bedrock at these glacial lake locations. Can we see the list in the bottle now? Sure. Hey, it kind of worked. Thanks. Yeah. So, I don't know, how's the sunlight here? Can you actually see the, the silt at the bottom? I can see it pretty good from my, oh, here. So here's our slack water sediment. And if I got really bold, which I'm not because I'm in the front porch and I'll get grounded for the next three weeks. But if we pour all this water off, which is basically getting rid of Lake Lewis after a few weeks through Wallula Gap, what are we left with? One of our very delicate layers of carrot cake and nothing's gonna destroy it because all we're doing is bleeding off this very quiet water. Thanks for that. Let's do a few more. Is there a layer of loose in the Bridge of the Gods? Banks as I see it as I drive through the Dalles. I'm confident the answer is no, Richard. It's too energetic there. Not only did the Ice Age floods uh, rip through the heart of the Columbia Gorge, meaning fast water, meaning hardly any slack water sediment being deposited at Bridge of the Gods. But then of course, we've had all the landslides since that time. We've had the Columbia River itself do a bunch of damage. So the only place that I'm aware of where you can see carrot cake in the Columbia River Gorge is to get up into the side canyons, get away from the Columbia River, get to where, remember now the Columbia River Gorge had Ice Age flood water halfway up the walls. And so you can think of a big Ice Age flood event coming down the Columbia Gorge and having a bunch of that water go up the, go up Hood River, go up the mouth of the Klickitat or the White Salmon or whatever. And that's where the quiet water would deposit some of the carrot cake. And that has been studied. Have there been fossils found? Um, no. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a super big... To me, it's a mystery. Like, there's nothing. There's no worm burrows. There's no uh, signs of insect life back then. There's no rodents. There's, it's like a dead zone. It's like a life, it's a lake. I know Lake Lewis was only there for a couple of weeks, but according to those varves, Glacial Lake Columbia was there for 50 to 100 years in between Ice Age floods. Where is the biology? It's apparently not there. But I don't know much about biology, so we'll leave that topic as quickly as possible. A few more. Liz is inside now. She's giving me the, the high sign. She wants some carrot cake, I think. Is that land where the ultralight was flying over, private or public? I don't know where he was specifically, slow modem. Um, it's a combination, uh, but it's on the way to Palouse Falls. Uh, I'm not even gonna try to look because I'm I have not, have, not having much luck finding things lately. Uh, but uh, there are some places, if you're, if you're using just a basic map and you can see where there's BLM land versus national forest land versus whatever else, state parks. You can walk over a lot of that stuff, but much of it's private as well, of course. Um, let's do three more. We need to compare ice core samples to get the carrot cake layer dates. Ice core samples. Well, I work with a gal, Susan Kaspari, who does a lot with ice core samples, and that helps us certainly with past climates, but I don't see how we can get info from an ice core and tie it specifically with slack water sediments. Uh, maybe you're visualizing something that I'm not thinking about. 
Are rhythmites easy to find in other places that have had Ice Age lakes, or this is unique to Washington, question mark? Well, Washington is unique, of course, with this Ice Age flood story. There are slack water sediments in the floor of Glacial Lake, Missoula. We're going to save that for next week. I, I know there are Ice Age floods in other parts of the world, and I, I assume there's plenty of slack water sediments there, but I don't know anything about those areas. Did the Ice Age floods get smaller over time as the glaciers receded, says Timothy. Well, it is interesting that our carrot cakes, the layers in our carrot cakes are getting thinner and thinner as we go up. And I think I said half an hour ago, and I'll say it again right now, you can run with that how you like. Does that mean each Ice Age flood making a slack water sediment is getting smaller and smaller? Does that mean the ice dam is lower and lower? You'll see there are some basic questions from Glacier Lake Missoula that remain when we talk about it next week. So your idea is, is certainly possible, but I don't, I don't think we all agree that that's the story. In fact, I know it's not true now that I think about it. Uh, I did uh, some Ice Age flood stuff last week or two weeks ago, and we talked about some of the biggest Ice Age floods at uh, like 22,000 years ago, 18,000 years ago, 16,000 years ago when we bust up the Okanagan lobe. Those were big events, and those were some of the last to happen. So now that I think about it, I, I, I don't know if we want to go that way. Gord wants to know, has anybody hypothesized on why there's so little organic material in the layers? Probably, but I haven't read that stuff. And even if they did, I, I don't know enough biology to figure it out or follow what they're saying. One more. Why can't you use cosmic ray dating methods on the layers? Well, when we talk about erratics next week, we'll talk about cosmic ray bombardment of a surface of a boulder. And then we collect a shell from that boulder and look for radioactive pairs to measure how much time has gone by. My basic answer, Jack, is that we don't have surfaces that are broad enough that we can sample. And it's just loose particles, by the way. It's not solid rock. So we wouldn't have a surface that's going to absorb that cosmic ray bombardment to figure that out. Now that said, there is something called OSL dating, which is optical stimulated luminescence dating, which I know very little about. And I haven't learned a lot about OSL dating because apparently from the experts that I talk to, they say it's still not very reliable. Many of, the slack, many of the carrot cakes have been studied by OSL dating, but there's so much error and so much disagreement with basic superposition and everything else that there's not a lot of stock put in those dates yet. So Jack, if you're asking about OSL dating, then that has been done, but I'm not using it tonight because I don't think it's as reliable as it could be from the people that I've talked to. Okay, that's plenty. I think it's a time for a toast. Nah. Once again, thank you so much for the cake, the carrot cake, the slack water sediment cake from Foodies Brick and Mortar Restaurants in Tri-Cities. Thank you, Joanna. Here's to you and your health. And the health of your parents, your grandparents, your children, your grandchildren, your friends, your neighbors. This is a delicious cake. 
Here's to all the healthcare workers who continue to do amazing things for all these weeks on our behalf. The mailmen, the UPS people who are coming to my house every day, all the folks who are doing the essential work. Here's to you all around the world. And I can't think of anything else to toast, but I need one more bite of this because it's perfect. Carrot cake, slack water sediment. Can I taste the loose? No. I appreciate you watching tonight. I thank you for watching this one. You're welcome to come back tomorrow night when we take this one step further and look carefully at places where the basalt was ripped up by the Ice Age floods. Good night from Ellensburg, Washington. I love you. I love you. I love you.